part three chapters eight nine and ten of bessie's fortune by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain eight gray and his aunt gray had been very sick the entire voyage since the day when he heard that bessie was dead he had lost all interest in everything and though he went wherever his aunt wished to go it was only to please her and not because he cared in the least for anything he saw from flossie he had never heard for her letter did not reach him and he had no thought that bessie was alive and everywhere he went he saw always the dear face white and still as he knew it must have looked when it lay in the coffin sometimes the pain in his heart was so hard to bear that he was half tempted to tell his aunt of his sorrow and crave her sympathy but this he had not done and bessie's name had never passed his lips since he heard she was dead at last alarmed by the pallor of his face and the tired listless manner so unlike himself lucy suggested that they go home and to this gray readily assented but first he must see bessie's grave and at london he left his aunt in charge of some friends who were going home in the same ship and would see her to liverpool he was going to wales on business he said and as she knew he had been there two or three times before lucy asked no questions and had no suspicion of the nature of the business which took him first to carnarvon where a last fruitless search was made for elizabeth rogers or some of her kin and then to stoneleigh which he reached on an early morning train the same which took bessie to liverpool thus near do the wheels of fate oftentimes come to each other in her hurry to secure a compartment bessie did not see the young man alighting from a carriage only the fourth from the one she was entering and as both anthony and dorothy who were at the station with her went across the bridge to do some errands before returning home no one observed gray as he hurried along the road to stoneleigh and entering the grounds stood at last by the new grave in the corner close to the fence where he believed bessie was lying bearing his head to the falling rain which seemed to cool his burning brow he said aloud darling bessie can you see me now do you know that i am here standing by your grave and do you know how much i love you surely it is not wrong to kneel for me to whisper to your dead ears the story of my love oh bessie i have come to say good-bye and my heart is breaking as i say it if you could only answer me could give me some token that you know it would be some comfort to me when i am far away for i am going home bessie to the home over the sea where i once hoped i might take you as my wife before i knew of neil's prior claim but so long as life lasts i shall remember the dear little girl who was so much to me and here i pledge my word that no other love shall ever come between us i have loved you i have lost you but thank god i have not lost your memory good-bye darling good-bye he stooped and kissed the rain-wet sod above the grave then walked swiftly away in the direction of bangor and took the first through train to liverpool on arriving at the hotel he learned that his aunt had already gone to the wharf with her friends and taking a cab he too was driven there meeting with neil who confounded and disgusted him with his apparent indifferences and heartlessness absorbed in his own sad reflection gray had no thought for any of his fellow-passengers whether steerage or cabin and disguised by her hood and veil bessie might have brushed against him without recognition so he had no idea how near she was to him and as the motion of the ship soon began to affect him he went to his state-room which he scarcely left again for several days once when the doctor was visiting him his aunt who was present asked if there were many sick among the steerage passengers and if they were comfortable there was but one who was very sick the doctor replied and her case puzzled him she seemed so superior to her class and so reticent with regard to herself i will go and see her lucy said and that afternoon she made her visit to bessie with the result we have seen puzzled and curious she went next to her nephew whom she found dressed and in his sea-chair which had been brought into his state-room he was better and was going on deck as soon as the steward could come and help him sitting down beside him lucy began rather abruptly i have heard you talk a great deal of neil macpherson whose father is brother to miss betsy macpherson of allington and i have heard you speak of a bessie macpherson do you know where she is gray's face was white as marble while a spasm of pain passed over his features as he said oh aunt lucy you do not know how you hurt me why do you speak of her because i have a suspicion that she is on the ship lucy replied but gray shook his head mournfully as he said to her 
that is impossible bessie is dead she died in rome last spring she was sick with the fever all the time we were there and i was with her every day but did not tell you as i knew you would be so anxious for me and when she died i could not talk of her to any one poor little bessie she was so young and sweet and pure you would have loved her so much yes lucy said taking one of gray's hands and holding it caressingly for she guessed what was in his heart tell me about her if you can you say she is dead and you are sure yes sure he answered i did not see her die it is true but i know she is dead and i have stood by her grave at stoneley when i left you in london i went to her grave and i believe i left all my life and soul there with her i never thought i could talk to any one of her but it seems a relief to me now to tell you about her shall i yes tell me lucy said and closing his eyes and leaning back wearily in his chair gray told her everything he knew with regard to bessie macpherson who had died in rome and whose grave he had stood beside in the yard at stoneleigh told her too of bessie's engagement to neil of which he had heard from jack trevelyan and of neil's apparent heartlessness and indifference when he met him in the streets of liverpool poor little bessie he said in conclusion you don't know what a weary life she led or how bravely she bore it but she is dead and perhaps it is better so than if she were the wife of neil poor boy lucy said very gently when he had finished his story you loved bessie very much yes i loved her so much that just to have her mine for one brief month i believe i would give twenty years of my life gray replied and every word was a sob for he was moved as he had never before been moved even when he first heard that bessie was dead all thoughts of going on deck were given up for that day and when the steward came to help him up the stairs he helped him instead to his berth where he lay with his eyes closed though lucy who sat beside him knew he was not asleep for occasionally a tear gathered on his long lashes and dropped upon his cheek late in the afternoon lucy made her way again to the steerage quarters for thoughts of the sick girl had haunted her continually though she did not now believe her to be the bessie whom gray had loved and lost but who was she and who was the neil of whom she had inadvertently spoken and why was she so like the bessie gray had described blue-eyed golden-haired with a face like an angel she repeated to herself as she descended the stairs to the lower deck and walked to the door around which several women were gathered with anxious concern upon their faces nine bessie is promoted she is took very bad mum one of the women said to lucy as she stood aside to let her pass into the close hot cabin where bessie was talking wildly and incessantly of her father and mother and of gray while mrs goodenough and jenny tried in vain to quiet her what is it how long has she been this way lucy asked and the voluble jenny replied and sure mum just after you left it struck to her head and she went out of herself entirely and goes on awful about her father and mother who died in rome with the favour and is buried in some stone hay for the likes of it and of grey jerry who she says is on the ship and won't come to her and sure would ye be so kind as to try yourself what ye can do talking of grey lucy repeated ten times more perplexed than she had been before how does she know my nephew and who is she then turning to mrs goodenough she continued there is some mystery here which i must solve i fancied this morning that she might be bessie macpherson of stoneleigh park bangor but my nephew tells me that she died in rome and if so who is this young girl oh madam mrs goodenough began there can be no harm in telling you now though she didn't want anybody to know not for herself she ain't a bit ashamed but some of her high friends is and made her promise to keep to herself who she was but you are bound to know and she is miss bessie macpherson of stoneleigh and she is not dead at all and never has been she had the fever in rome but she got well and it was her mother who died there this is the truth and may god forgive me if i have done harm by my tattling you have done no harm lucy replied but on the contrary a great good to miss macpherson whom i shall at once have removed to my state-room fortunately i am alone and can share it with her as well as not what lucy gray willed to do she went about at once and in less than an hour she had interviewed the captain the purser and the doctor and while the passengers were at dinner bessie was lifted carefully in jenny's strong arms and taken to miss gray's state-room 
where she was laid upon the lounger under the window as the place where she would have more room and better air the change seemed to revive her at once and when after her dinner miss gray returned to her state-room she found bessie sleeping quietly with the faithful jenny keeping watch beside her the next morning she was still better and jenny who had insisted upon sitting beside her during the night was delighted to find her fever gone and her reason restored very wonderingly bessie looked around her when she first awoke from a sleep which had lasted several hours and then as her eyes fell upon jenny she asked what is it jenny what has happened this is not the steerage where am i and indeed ye are in heaven and that's the angel who brought you here jenny replied nodding toward miss gray who came at once to bessie's couch bending over her and kissing her gently she said i am glad you are better yes bessie answered falteringly but what is it how came i here in as few words as possible lucy explained to her that she had discovered her identity and could not allow her to remain where she was it was not right for me to have this large room all to myself and leave you in that cramped crowded place she said and bessie answered her yes it was kind in you but i am sorry you found me out i promised no one should know me neil will be so angry and disgraced drat that neil whoever he is jenny exclaimed energetically disgraced indeed i only wish i had him by the scruff of his neck if he thinks anything can disgrace you or make you less a lady them smells and they are awful sometimes when half the folks is sick can't do it at this speech bessie laughed aloud the first real laugh since her mother died but it did her good and when jenny had washed her face and brushed her hair and given her her breakfast she declared herself able to get up but this lucy would not allow you must be quiet to-day and to-morrow you can go on deck she said and then as jenny had gone out she sat down by bessie's side and taking one of her hands continued do you think you are strong enough to see an old friend by and by bessie knew she meant gray and the hot blood surged into her face as she answered eagerly yes oh yes he will bring stonely back to me he was so kind when father died and in rome and everywhere can i see him now not just yet miss gray said smiling at the young girl's eagerness which showed itself in every feature i doubt if gray is yet up he has been sick all the voyage and is very weak and i must prepare him first he thinks you are dead dead bessie repeated how can he think so i do not understand as briefly as possible miss gray explained all she knew of the mistake which the messenger boy must have made when he told gray in florence that bessie had died the very day he left rome oh yes i see bessie rejoined it was the american girl on the same floor with me flossie told me of her and i heard them taking her away that night oh it was so sad and mr gerald thought it was i was he sorry miss gray she asked the question timidly and into her eyes there came a look of great gladness when her friend replied yes very very sorry will you tell him i am not dead it was poor mamma who died tell him i am here bessie continued and miss gray looked curiously at the girl who being as she supposed engaged to neil could be so glad that gray was sorry and so eager to see him yes i will tell him and bring him to you after a little but you must be quiet and not excite yourself too much i must have you well when we reach new york and we have only three days more miss gray replied and then with a kiss she went away to gray's stateroom at the other end of the ship but he was not there and upon inquiry she learned that he had gone up on deck where she found him in his chair sitting by himself and gazing out upon the sea with that sad troubled look on his face which had of late become habitual and of which she now knew the reason gray she said drawing an unoccupied chair close to him and speaking very low you are better this morning do you think you can bear some very good news yes he answered her what is it are we nearer new york than we supposed no it has nothing to do with new york or the ship but somebody in it gray and lucy spoke hurriedly now did it never occur to you that possibly you were mistaken with regard to bessie's death that it might be some one else who died in rome and was buried at stoneleigh her mother perhaps what and gray drew a long gasping breath as he stared wonderingly at her go on he added tell me what you mean 
i mean his aunt replied that bessie is not dead i have seen her i have spoken with her she is on the ship she is in my state-room waiting for you she is the sick girl i told you about gray made an effort to spring from his chair but had not the power to do so the shock had been too great and he sank back half fainting whispering as he did so tell me everything now at once it will not harm me joy seldom kills tell me the whole she told him all she knew and the particulars of her finding bessie among the steerage passengers and having her removed to her room yes i see i understand how the mistake occurred gray said but why did not neil tell me he had been to see her off he was probably ashamed to let you know that she was in the steerage he hoped you would not find her miss gray replied and gray exclaimed the coward if it were not wrong i should have him while a fierce pang shot through his heart that bessie was bound to kneel and that though living she was no nearer to him than if she were dead and in that grave by which he had so lately stood still it would be something to see her again to hear her voice to look into her eyes and have her all to himself for the remainder of the voyage which he now wished had just commenced thank god she lives even though she does not live for me he said to himself and then at his aunt's suggestion he tried to control his nerves and bring himself into a quieter calmer condition before going down to see her it was nearly an hour before he felt himself strong enough to do it and when at last he reached the narrow passage and knew there was but a step between him and bessie he trembled so that his aunt was obliged to support him as he steadied himself against the door of the state-room glancing in for an instant miss gray put her finger on her lip saying to him she is asleep sit quietly down till she wakens there was a buzzing in gray's ears and a blur before his eyes so that he did not at once see distinctly the face which lay upon the pillow resting on one hand with the bright hair clinging about the neck and brow bessie had fallen asleep while waiting for him and there was a smile upon her lips and a flush upon her cheek which made her more like the bessie he knew at stoneleigh than like the white-faced girl he had left in rome and whom he had never thought to see again it is bessie and she is alive he said under his breath and bending over her he softly kissed her forehead saying as he did so my darling just for the moment mine if neil's by and by for an instant bessie moved uneasily then slept again while gray watched her with a great hunger in his heart and a longing to take her in his arms and in spite of a hundred neil's tell her of his love how beautiful she was in that calm sleep and gray noted every point of beauty from the sheen of her golden hair to the dimpled hand which was just within his reach poor little hand he said laying his own carefully upon it how much it has done for others oh if i could only call it mine it should never know toil again he might have raised it to his lips if just then the eyes had not unclosed as with a start bessie awoke and looked wonderingly at him for an instant then instead of withdrawing her hand from his she held the other towards him and raising herself up cried out oh mr gerald i am so glad nothing is half so dreary now that i know you are on the ship and you will tell neil it was not my fault that you found me he may be very angry at the mention of neil a feeling of constraint crept over gray and he quietly released his hands from bessie's lest he should say to her words he ought not to say to one who was plighted to another and bessie noticed the change in him and her lip quivered in a grieved kind of way as she said you thought me dead and you were sorry just a little oh bessie and with a mighty effort gray managed to control himself you will never know how sorry or how glad i am to find you still alive but you must not talk to me now you must rest so as to go on deck and get some strength and some colour back in your cheeks i promised auntie not to stay long i will come again by and by drawing the covering around her as deftly as a woman could have done he went out and left her alone to wonder at his manner bessie had never forgotten the words spoken to her in rome and which she had said he must never repeat over and over again at intervals had sounded in her ears i love you with my whole heart and soul and whether you live or die you will be the sweetest memory of my life she had not died she had lived she had seen him again and found him changed perhaps it was better so she reasoned and yet she was conscious of a feeling of disappointment or loss though it was such joy to know he was near her and that by and by he would come to see her again 
and he came after lunch and the steward carried her on deck and wrapped her in miss gray's warm rug and gray himself sat down beside her and talked to her of america and she told him that she was not going to be a burden to her aunt or even a guest very long but to work and earn money with which to pay her debts and gray let her do most of the talking and even promised if she did not succeed in allington to see if he could find something for her to do in boston i am very sure i could find you a situation there if i tried he said with a merry look in his eyes which was lost on bessie whose thick veil was over her face and who was gazing off upon the waves bearing her so fast toward the strange land to which she was going the next day she was able to walk the deck for some hours with gray as her attendant and when at last land was in sight she seemed almost as well and bright as ever as she stood looking eagerly upon either shore and declaring america beautiful as a picture it had been arranged that she should stop for a few hours at the hotel with miss lucy and gray and then go on with them to allington but their plans were changed when they reached the wharf for they were met by a messenger who had been sent from mr burton gerald with the intelligence that gray's mother was very ill and that lucy must come at once with gray without stopping at her own home i am sorry for i wish to take you to your aunt myself lucy said to bessie adding after a moment but i will give you a letter of introduction if you like no thank you bessie replied i would rather go to her alone so that if she is kind i shall know it is to me and not to you or because she thinks it will please you no danger of that gray said laughingly she is a great stickler for the naked truth as she expresses it and all the aunt lucy's in the world could not make her say she liked you if she did not she is a singular specimen but she is sure to like you and if she does not go to my aunt hannah she would welcome you as a godsend she is the auntie who lives in the pasture land i shall soon come to allington and see you he added as he bade her good-bye for he and his aunt were to take the express which did not stop at allington and she was to take the accommodation which did he had made all the arrangements for her and had seen that her baggage was checked and her ticket bought but still she felt very desolate and helpless when he left her and she was alone with jenny who stayed by her to the last promising to let her know if she heard of any situation either as governess or a companion mrs goodenough had gone at once with her daughter who had met her at the wharf but jenny's cousin who lived out of the city had sent her husband to the ship and as he was porter in one of the large warehouses and did not go home till night jenny had leisure to attend to bessie whom she saw to the train and to whom she said at parting keep your veil down honey for there's spalpeens and blackguards everywhere and they might be for spakin to ye good-bye god bless ye ten bessie meets her aunt the accommodation train from new york to boston was late that day there was a detention at hartford and another at springfield so that the clock on miss betsy mcpherson's mantel struck seven when she heard the whistle of the locomotive as the car stopped at the allington station as miss betsy was when we last saw her so she was now tall and angular and severe and looking as she sat in her hard straight back chair like the very embodiment of the naked truth from the fit of her dress to the scanty handful of hair twisted in a knot at the back of her head she had heard of daisy's death from her brother only a few days before and had felt a pang of regret that she had treated her quite so harshly on the occasion of her visit to her i might at least have been civil to her though it did make me so mad to see her smirking up into my face with all those diamonds on her and to know that she was even trying to fool young allen brown and then her thoughts went after bessie for whom her brother had asked help saying she was left entirely alone in the world and was for aught he knew a very nice girl it is impossible for me to care for her he wrote and as my wife paid all the expenses of her sickness in rome and for bringing the body home she will do no more so it rests with you to care for bessie i should think you would like some young person with you in your old age in my old age miss betsy repeated to herself as she sat thinking of john's letter yes i suppose it has come to that for i am in my sixties and the boys call me the old woman when i order them out of the cherry tree and still i feel almost as young as i did forty years ago when charlie died oh charlie my life would have been so different had you lived and in the eyes usually so stern and uncompromising there were great tears as the lonely woman's thoughts went back to the long ago and the awful tragedy which had darkened all her life and then it was that in the midst of her softened mood a little girlish figure dressed in black came up the steps and knocked timidly at the open door 
bessie had left her luggage at the station and walked to the house which was pointed out to her as miss macpherson's by a boy who volunteered to show her the way and who said to her she's a queer old cove and if you don't mind your p's and q's she will take your head off she's game she is this was not very reassuring and bessie's heart beat rapidly as she went up the steps to the door she saw the square straight figure in the chair and was prepared for the quick sharp come in which answered her knock adjusting her spectacles to the right focus miss betsy looked up at her visitor in that scrutinizing inquisitive manner usual with her and which made bessie's knees shake under her as she advanced into the room who are you the look seemed to say and without waiting to have it put into words bessie went straight to the woman and stretching out her hand said imploringly oh aunt bessie do you remember a little girl who came to you on the terrace of aberritswith years ago little bessie macpherson to whom you sent a ring here it is and she pointed to it upon her finger and i am she bessie and mother is dead and i-i am all alone and i have come to america to you not to have you keep me not to live upon you but to earn my living to work for money with which to pay my debts two hundred and fifty pounds to lady jane for mother's sickness and burial and five pounds to anthony that is the sum two hundred and fifty-five pounds will you let me stay to-night can you find me something to do bessie had told her whole story and as she told it her face was a study with its look of eagerness and fear and the bright colour which came and went so rapidly but as she finished speaking left it white as ashes miss bessie's face was a study too as she regarded the girl fixedly until she stopped talking then motioning her to a chair she said sit down child before you faint away you are pale as a cloth take off your bonnet and have some tea i suppose you are hungry she rang the bell for susan to bring hot tea and toast which she made bessie eat pressing it upon her until she could take no more now then she said when the tray had been removed one can always talk better on a full stomach so tell me what you want and what you expect me to do but sit over there where i can see you better and don't get excited i shall not eat you at least not to-night she wanted bessie in a good light where she could see her face from which she never took her eyes as the girl repeated in substance what she had said at first making some additions to her story and speaking of the ship in which she had come but not of miss lucy or gray where did you get the money it cost something to cross the ocean miss betsy asked a little sharply and bessie replied it did not cost me much for i came out as a steerage passenger i had just enough for that and my ticket here you came in the steerage and in her surprise miss betsy arose from her chair and walked once or twice across the floor while bessie looked at her wistfully wondering if she too were ashamed like neil but shame had no part in miss betsy's feelings which were stirred by a far different emotion resuming her seat after a moment she said and you have come here to work to earn money what can you do i thought i might teach french perhaps and german i am a pretty good scholar in both bessie replied and her aunt rejoined french and german fiddlesticks there are more fools teaching those languages than there are idiots to learn them why my washerwoman's daughter is teaching french at twenty-five cents a lesson though she can no more speak it than a jackdaw french indeed you must try something else or you will never earn that two hundred and fifty-five pounds this was not very encouraging and bessie felt the colour dyeing her face and her heart sinking as she said i might sew so. i am handy with my needle i have made all my own dresses and dorothy's too yes you might sew so. and twist your spine all out of shape and get the liver complaint miss betsy interposed and then poor bessie fearing that everything was slipping from her said with a choking sob i might be a housemaid to some one surely there are such situations to be had and i would try so hard to please and even work for less than the other girls of more experience oh aunt betsy you must know of some place for me you will help me to find one you do not know how greatly i desire it or how poor i am these are the only boots i have and she put out a much-worn boot which had been blacked until the leather was nearly cracked apart and this is my only decent dress except a dark calico but i do not care so much for that it is not clothes i want it is to pay that money to lady jane 
the tears were falling like rain from bessie's eyes and starting again from her chair miss macpherson went to an open window and shut it as if she were cold then returning to her seat she said abruptly i thought you were engaged to neil he wrote me to that effect bessie's face was scarlet as she answered i was engaged to him then i am not now did he break it or you was the next question i broke it was the low response why came next from miss macpherson and bessie replied he did not wish me to come as steerage and bade me choose between that and him and as i must come and had no money for a first-class ticket i gave him back the ring and he was free are you sorry this was spoken sharply and miss macpherson's little round black eyes rested curiously upon bessie who answered promptly no oh no i am very glad it is better so we were not suited to each other i should think not and again the strange woman arose and going to the window opened it as if in sudden heat then returning to her niece she continued were you in earnest when you said you would take a position as housemaid yes was the reply and miss macpherson went on do you think you could fill it i know i could i have been housemaid at home all my life we never kept any female servant but dorothy there was a moment's silence while miss macpherson seemed to be thinking and then she said will you take that place with me with you bessie repeated a little bewildered and her aunt replied yes with me why not better serve me than a stranger my second girl sarah was married a few weeks ago more fool she and i have no one as yet in her place if you will like it and fill it as well as she did i will give you what i gave her two dollars and a half a week and more if you earn it what do you say i will take the place bessie answered unhesitatingly feeling that singular as it might seem to serve her aunt she would rather do that than go to a stranger i will take the place and do the best i can and if i fail in some things at first you will tell me what to do how long will it take to earn two hundred and fifty pounds at two dollars and a half a week miss betsy must have felt cold again for she rushed to the open window and shut it with a bang while for an instant she wavered in her determination then thinking to herself i may as well see what stuff she really is made of she returned to bessie who if she had not been quite so anxious and nervous would have felt amused at her eccentric behaviour without telling how long it would take to earn two hundred and fifty-five pounds at two dollars and a half a week miss betsy said then it is a bargain and you are my housemaid really and willing to do a housemaid's duties and take a housemaid's place do you understand all that means i think so bessie answered wondering if she should have to share the cook's bed as if divining her thoughts her aunt rejoined one exception i shall make in your favour you will occupy the little room next my own at the head of the stairs you can go up there at once if you like and i will see that your trunks are brought from the station oh thank you bessie said and in her eyes there was a look of gratitude which nearly upset miss macpherson's resolution again and did make her open the window as she passed it on her way upstairs with bessie just as the room had been fitted up years ago when she was expecting the child bessie just so it was now when the girl bessie entered it the same single bed with its muslin hangings the same little bureau with its pretty toilet set now somewhat faded and passe in style but showing what it had been and in a corner the big doll with all its paraphernalia around it oh auntie bessie cried as she stepped across the threshold what a lovely little room and it almost looks as if it had been intended for me when i was younger it was meant for you years ago when i wrote to your father and asked him to give you to me fool that i was i thought he would let you come but he did not and so the room has waited i never knew you sent for me bessie said but father could not have spared me and oh auntie i cannot tell you how it makes me feel to know you have kept me in your mind all these years let me kiss you please and throwing her arms around her aunt's neck bessie sobbed hysterically for a few moments while the stern face bending over her relaxed in its severity and miss betsy's voice was very kind and soothing as she said there there child don't get up a headache i'm glad you like the room glad you are here you had better go to bed and not come down again she did not kiss the girl but she put her hand on her head and smoothed the curly hair and bessie felt that it was a benediction 
when she was alone she sank upon her knees by the bedside and burying her face in her hands prayed earnestly that she might know what was right to do and be a comfort and help to the woman whose peculiarity she began in part to understand she was so glad to be there so glad for the shelter of a home that the fact of being a housemaid did not trouble her at all though she did wonder what neil would say and if he would not think it quite as bad as steerage and wondered too if gray would ever come to see her and if he would recognize her in her new position it will make no difference with gray gerald what you are something said to her and comforted with this assurance she fell asleep in her new home End of chapters eight nine and ten